Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to this event of the Sports Food and Search Assessment. Uh, my name is Paul McKenna. I'm one of the Deputy Associate Principals for Research and Knowledge Exchange here at the University of Strathclyde. And it's my privilege to chair this event this morning. So in addition to the attendees here in the University's Court Senate room, we have uh, lots of attendees online, I think from registered from 50 million institutions in total across the UK. So welcome to you all. Now for context, this event forms part of the University's Research Integrity and Century 2024. Uh, this is jointly organized by our Research and Knowledge Exchange Services and our Organizational and Staff Development Unit. The purpose of this week is really to promote and facilitate student research practice by enhancing staff and student understanding research integrity and culture. This specific event focuses on research assessment, which of course is pivotal in, in academia. It, it shapes the trajectory of individual careers, it influences institutional rankings, and ultimately it affects the direction of research research programs. So as we convene here, we are of course keenly aware of the complexities and um, the challenges inherent in the systems of research assessment. Over the past decade, attention or paid to responsible research assessment has been growing, particularly as problems with existing systems of research uh, measurement and assessment have been highlighted. And in particular, the this application of the NORA criteria and indicators of research quality have been seen to distort incentives to create unstable pressures on researchers, and it's also created to problems with research integrity and reproducibility. To reduce diversity of research missions and purposes as researchers focus on our success criteria, or indeed to focus on lower risk research. Uh, to negatively affect the careers and well being of those who choose not to prioritize the NARA criteria, and to draw focus away from the wide range of activities that maximize research quality and impact towards things that can be more easily measured. In response, there has been a global recognition of the need to embed responsible research assessment, evidenced clearly in over 24,500 signatures to the San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment. So now is a timely opportunity to discuss how we can build upon the impetus um, uh, to promote systemic reform of research assessment practices. And there, indeed, there are various ongoing matters which requires this attention at the moment. The publication of Quora, Quora in late 2022, which means that many organizations are considering uh, whether to sign. There's the development of REF 2029 uh, policy, particularly the debates around the design of the people, culture, and environment assessment and the consultations associated with that. And there's the research, the recent uh, establishment of a, a UK Quora national chapter to provide a forum for organizations to reflect on their progress, to work together to implement best practice, and ultimately to influence other UK organizations to adopt the principles of responsible research assessment. So this event this morning brings together people from across the UK to consider the key question of where next for responsible research assessment. By facilitating this inclusive discussion, we hope to promote awareness and help sustain momentum towards systemic reform of research assessment, towards processes that recognize the diverse outputs, practices, and activities that maximize the quality and impact of research and that value the people and the part of that research. So to this end, we have uh, convened an exciting uh, number of expert speakers. They were in a range of perspectives on the point of research assessment to stimulate debate around the technologies. The first speaker this morning will be Professor Stephen Curry uh, from the Imperial College of London. Stephen is the former chair of DORA, 
and the co-author of Harnessing the Metric Time and the Changing Role of Funders in Responsible Research Assessment. He's also Director of Strategy and Research on Research Institute. Welcome, to you. Your second speaker is Dr. Neil Jacobs from the UK Youth for Feasibility Report. Neil is head of the UKRN Open Research Program, which is a five year research England initiative to uh, improve training, recognition, and reward for quality and research. Neil will be presenting the findings of their recent OO survey about institutional policies and practices in relation to research assessment reform and open research. Or, or in the open and responsible research and reward and recognition project. Welcome, you. And welcome also to Emma Day from Vite. Uh, Emma is a project manager involved in the coalition for advancing research protection and boost consulting, which is about strengthening flora and enabling systemic reform and research assessment. She's also involved in the Open Universal Science Project. And rewards and incentives for research. We are hugely grateful to all three speakers for giving up their time to join us this morning. The person here is Stuart Clyde. And I look forward to a stimulating set of talk and discussion during the question and answer session that follows. But just before we begin the talks, we do have a little bit of housekeeping to cover. Uh, this event is being recorded, the link will be shared. Uh, both within attendee, uh, in, in, excuse me, in person and webinar attendees afterwards, and copies of the presentation, the presentations will be circulated. There will be some dedicated time for questions later in the session, as I mentioned, and for those joining online, you can ask the questions through the Q&A function, and these will be moderated and fed uh, into the Q&A session. Contributions should be open and, and inclusive, and we encourage attendees to share their perspectives and ask questions in an appropriate manner. And finally, for those of you in the person here in the room, uh, there are no scheduled fire drills today. So if the fire alarm sounds, please make your way to the fire exits, which are the rear of the room, through the entrance, and here also at the front, two sides. Toilets are located down the corridor, so once again, exit the way we came in. And lunch will be ser served in one of the adjacent rooms uh, after the event. Thank you for your attention, and let's begin with the first speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, in introduction, Paul, and uh, my thanks to the organizers and particularly to Grace for the invitation to, uh, to be with you this morning. So let me try and offer you a few uh, semi-coherent thoughts about where next for uh, responsible research assessment in the 10 or 15 minutes that I, that I have. I want to try and keep it short so that there's uh, actually plenty of time for you and discussion. So uh, the short answer to that question, I hope, is onwards and upwards. Uh, but there is a, a much longer answer, which uh, which I think we will get to uh, get to uh, today. Um, oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Let's try that way. That looks better. Um, so the overarching thing always to bear in mind is when we are engaging in research assessment is actually to think about what is it that actually we want from the search, because the the answer to that question then ultimately is what shapes the approaches that we should take to research assessment activities. And I would refer you to this very good paper. It's now 25 years old, but it really was a rather prescient uh, and prophetic um, and document talking about you know, science as uh, social content um, and recognizing that while there was a kind of post-war consensus that uh, you know, scientists should just be left alone, do their stuff, publish their papers, uh, and then uh, everybody else would kind of take care of the rest. And there was an increasing recognition in part because governments were actually spending much, much more money uh, on uh, R&D uh, than they had hitherto, and that actually that then engendered a new contract, and uh, Michael Gibbons recognised that actually what was really demanding of the research community was just not just knowledge that was reliable, but knowledge that was socially robust, and by that uh, he meant that the production was seen by society to be both transparent and participative, and that reflects, I think, a change in the 
the culture of research, a change in the mission or the explicit missions of universities. And that is a thinking that certainly over the past 25 years has been absorbed into our mechanisms of research assessment. And we perhaps in the UK particularly see that in the, the gradual evolution of the REF, which is the research assessment excellence par, research assessment exercise par excellence. Um, but we're here today to talk about uh, responsible research assessment. And I just really want to emphasize, as Paul mentioned in his introduction, is that you know, that concept is something that has evolved and emerged uh, through worldwide discussions, actually, and initiatives and thinking and advocacy, uh, certainly over the past 10 or even uh, 15 years. Uh, Dora was, I guess, one of the starting points and one of the kind of the first uh, sort of manifesto, shall we say, or uh, activist organizations that came into fruition. But this is a a dialogue that's been taking uh, place all over the world. I'm not going to go through all of these, but the links are all active. So when you have the PDF, you can you can follow them up. But FOLEC is a, a Latin American um, initiative. We see the Hong Kong principles on research integrity. I just want to highlight a couple of sort of important um, um, sort of uh, uh, staging points. This the metric tide was, I think, one of the first documents to sort of introduce the concept of responsible metrics or I actually I would prefer to phrase it as the responsible use of metrics. Uh, and then that thinking is, was developed even further then in a sort of joint report produced by UKRI, the NRF in South Africa, Rory and Dora, looking at the particular role of funders, which articulated, I think, for one of the first times that you know, what it is we mean by responsible research assessment. And that was broadening out the concept that actually for research assessment, obviously, we, we don't just think of we don't just think of metrics. And so this is, you know, evolutionary thinking and one of the most important recent developments, and that's, again, one of the focuses for, for today's event is the emergence then of COARA, uh, which I think is a very important uh, initiative that is now trying yet further to put more meat on the, on the flesh of the ideas around what responsible research assessment actually looks like and how it's going to work in practice. I think there's a wide recognition that the time for talking is over and the time for action is really something that we need to, to get on with. And that's certainly a, an attitude that in my uh, six years as chair of DORA, I tried to uh, inculcate. And in terms of you know thinking about research assessment and thinking about what it is that we want to do, this is DORA's vision, but I think it's one that is actually widely shared and that we will see sort of parallel strands of in many of the documents that were on the, the previous slide. But you know we are interested in research that's, you know, um, um, reliable, um, um, rapidly shared, rapidly communicated, accessible, high quality, uh, that can transform our understanding of the world and change it for the better. But we also need to think about researchers. We want researchers who are highly talented, who collaborate, who are team builders, who feel a responsibility to the societies that they belong to, and then a research system that actually values the people who work within it, who empowers them to do their best work, cares about their quality of life, and seeks out the creative uh, vigor of diversity. Now, that's a bunch of nice words, okay? And I'm sure we all have a bit more feeling in our hearts about that. And hopefully there's no massive dissent from that sort of shared vision. The trick is really is to put that into practice. And in doing that, I think we have to recognize some of the realities of the world. And that, that thing can emerge from sort of a growing recognition that the push to reform research assessment was actually intersecting in mostly synergistic ways, I think, with other important reform movements that have come into the sort of uh, higher education sphere, particularly the, the drive for open scholarship, which you know, started in the late 90s with open access, but now it's a much broader vision around um, open data. But actually the whole idea of you know, openness of the and the transparency that Gibbons wanted back in 19. 99, you know, raises important questions, not just about sharing data and publishing papers and making people read, but actually thinking about how open the academy is to participation. And that then links up, of course, then with the uh, more recent, I think, focus on the need for equity and inclusion within the academy. We're still predominantly male, we're still predominantly white uh, in the UK, across Europe, uh, and, in, and in other parts of the world. And we know that research assessment is one of the sort of pinch points at which historical biases and the, the sort of express themselves in order to um, preserve the status quo. And I think we want to really think about 
what is the status quo and how are we going to how are we going to change that for the better? And these intersecting movements really have a focal point, which is around research culture. And that's why I think that attention to research culture is something that has become more to the fore in um, in the research assessment, because ultimately these decisions, whether it's to promote someone or to hire them or to fund their grant, you know, these impact people. Uh, and they are very much transmit the values that we have uh, within the academy. I just want to sort of put you a little sidebar into a point because Koara I've mentioned is a very important um, um, initiative and one that certainly at DORA we very strongly support. And just to give a little bit of historical context, DORA was present at the Paris meeting in 19, uh, I'm sorry, not 1922. <laughs> <laughs> Even I wasn't around in uh, uh, where the sort of agreement was kind of first uh, announced, and actually we were very much part of the uh, the sort of working group that uh, commented on the draft agreement and on the implementation plans. And actually, Dora, along with the European Commission, is one of only two organisations that has observer status on the uh, steering committee of Coara. And so, you know, our goals are it's very much aligned. I know there, are, I think there is some. Confusion, perhaps particularly in the UK, if I don't know what I mean, I go to Guana. And I hope that actually we have the discussions today and we'll hear more about from Edmund's talk. Actually, we can just see that we're actually very much more than one say in France. And uh, all we really have to do is just make sure that we're joined up and all of the work. The mechanisms are certainly in place to do that. Uh, but I do think we want to think about, you know, the, the burdens that uh, that research assessment form puts on universities, because my goodness, universities are very burdened uh, these days. So in the last sort of section, uh, I want to come then to the uh, harassing the metric tide report that, that Paul mentioned, which I was involved in writing with James Wilson, uh, Martin Crime at Rory, and Lizzie Gant from uh, the University, uh, who's very, very active uh, in this space. So this was work that was commissioned by uh, Research England and the other national Irish government funders uh, to just have a sort of look back at the metric tide report in the seven years on uh, since it had been published and you know, what was what had really changed in the sector was there a scope perhaps to revise some of the recommendations that come out of the metric tide and to think about how that might impact um, a future ref. Uh, this was a rather quick piece of work. We were commissioned in May of 2022 and we published our report in December. Uh, of that year, but we did run a number of workshops uh, online uh, for different sectors of the, uh, the higher education uh, community. And one of the things that we really saw or heard loud and clear, and which we had sort of seen in our own reading anyway, was um, again the demand for actions, not yet more words, uh, but a demand for assessment to in incentivize positive change in research culture. I think that, you know, the rise, I think, of the, the sort of EI agenda is certainly an important. Um, um, part of that, but also the recognition that bullying and harassment are still um, a major scourge within uh, within many walks uh, of modern life, unfortunately, but also uh, very much within um, higher education. And so, one of the recommendations was that you know more weight should be put on uh, the environment statements, and that actually they should be more structured, and that they should embrace that sort of wider agenda, thinking about um, people and culture, as it turns out, and recommendation. Uh, certainly seems to have been absorbed. And this, of course, then is the plan for, well, it says REST 28 up there, but uh, now, of course, we know, thank goodness, uh, we have yet one more year of, uh, of uh, to prepare uh, for the next REF. And so the environment statement now becomes people, culture, and environment. And the plan at the minute, but it's not locked, it's not written in stone yet, is that that should go to 25%, up from 15%. And to pay for that, then um, the weight on the outputs is reduced from 60% to 50%. And this is very much seen as an opportunity to reshape the incentives within the research system to rethink what should be recognized and rewarded. And so that's echoing, I think, the, the philosophy that Michael Gibbons introduced back in uh, at 99. And, and also recognize the importance of research culture in underpinning excellent research. The response to that proposal was not universally positive. Okay, so uh, writing in uh, 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 an education policy policy note, Professor Sir Nigel Thrift, Thrift um, former Vice Chancellor of University of Warwick, says the REF could mark the beginning of a long goodbye 
uh, to notions of research excellence, which we so badly need to keep hold of. Uh, in Mansfield, who, if you don't know, what the policy exchange, the organizations is briefing recently got Michelle Donnellan into a little bit of bother, <laughs> says this will be devastating for UK research excellence. Outstanding research is being slashed to just 50% uh, uh, of the total score. 25% rewarded to people and culture. Actually, it's not. It's people, culture, and environment. Get it right. Uh, the right EDI schemes will be fully half as important as actually producing outstanding research. And I think Hope you'll agree with me that that's a somewhat a mischaracterization of it. And I think neither of these authors have really taken on board the intimate links and interactions between research culture and research excellence and how a, a negative or a harmful research culture is actually detrimental to the quality of research outputs that are produced. The right response. This is really not about you know warm words about culture or about EDI and, and sacrificing research excellence. It's about recognizing the synergism between those two, and that we cannot have one um, without the other. Now, what does? Oh, I one no. No. oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Sorry, just a bit confused by my own slides there, but back on track. Um, so, uh, but what do we mean by research culture? And that's an open question, and I think there is a multitude of answers to them. Uh, I have sort of you know, come up with a list here of things that I think are important facets of research culture that are necessary for the highest quality of research. And I think it's really important that we emphasize the link between those. So we want to you know, recognize the processes that enable high quality research. Those include, you know, um, healthy um, efforts towards collaboration and co-creation, not only within the academy, but with other important stakeholders. Freedom of inquiry, academic freedom, ask any question, argue any point has to be absolutely central to that. Freedom from bullying, harassment, and mismanagement. How much does bullying, harassment, and mismanagement degrade the productivity and the quality of the work that people are able to do? Uh, in their uh, day operations. We need to recruit from the broadest pool of talent. There's absolutely no notion of compromising um, on quality here. It's about recognizing that actually our recruitment processes, our promotion processes do suffer from bias and don't necessarily always then promote um, the real talent that's out there because of sexism, racism, ableism, uh, and whatnot. Uh, commitments to career development, good mentorship, how much value do we really place on that? How do we reward for risk taking? And again, to address this point about, you know, there's often a conservatism in, when it comes to peer review, which means to be incremental. How do we, you know, ensure that people are not penalized for a failure of well-constructed ambition? I think they should be penalized for badly designed experiments and papers that make no sense whatsoever. So that kind of figure be punished, but actually the, the noble failure of a brilliant idea that maybe didn't quite come off, uh, we should be able to find and make space for it. And obviously research integrity and I'm um, guessing the uh, What else? This is not a comprehensive list. I don't claim to have got it all. Um, can we capture all of these facets with quantitative indicators? Probably not. Uh, there's a lot of work going on now and um, commissioned by the <laughs> not listen deeply. Um, um, to look at how indicators might be constructed and how there might be an appropriate balance between quantitative uh, evidence and qualitative uh, narratives around you know, what universities are doing in terms of promoting uh, healthy research. I think if it's boiled down to a set of indicators, that will be a bad direction to go in because universities will naturally play the game and they will just focus on whatever the indicators are and they'll forget um, about everything else. So we do need to make sure that the qualitative and quantitative aspects are in a healthy tension. And I do hope that Research England and the other uh, uh, funding bodies will actually encourage cultural pluralism. I don't think there's one culture to rule them all. We have a tremendous diversity of institutions around uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, I think we want to make sure that, you know, those different and diverse flowers can bloom. And so, I'd like to see you know, something like a menu of options be offered in terms of defining facets of people 
of an environment, and then for universities to be allowed to pick a subset that they think best reflects you know, their efforts to develop a uh, culture. So on that note, I will thank you for your kind attention. Uh, and I guess we'll do questions in the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Stephen, for introducing uh, today so, so well and setting out um, such a, a really useful framing of, of what we're going to talk about today. So I work for the UK Reproducibility Network, which is a network of institutions, so researchers, funders, publishers, and others who's interested in, broadly speaking, the rigour and transparency of, of research. Uh, and these are the things that I'm going to sketch through. Um, whether I need glasses. So I'm at that stage in life where I sometimes wear glasses and I sometimes don't, and I usually get it wrong. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things we care about, which is going to be a subset of the things that Stephen talked about, but they're things that the UK Reproducibility Network particularly cares about. I will argue that there are problems, um, because unless there are things that need to be put right, then we don't really have a case for action. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some evidence of uh, some of the causes and what people think about the causes of those problems. Uh, I'll summarise at the end, I probably won't say too much about next steps. Hopefully we can have a conversation about that as part of, part of the discussion. Um, so some of the things we care about. As I say, the UK Reproducibility Network, we're particularly focused on rigorous, open, transparent, reproducible research, and we've developed a the definition of that or an understanding of that, which we hope is reasonably inclusive, um, inclusive in terms of a range of different disciplines, methods, and so on. So it's research that's sufficiently transparent that someone with sufficient expertise can clearly follow how that research was done, why it was done in that way, the evidence that it established, and the reasoning and judgments that were used in there for how the findings were, were reached. Um, so we're very focused on the research process and the quality of the research process that will lead to high quality research outcomes. And all sorts of things get wrapped up in that research process, of course. Uh, people are a part of the process. Uh, operating procedures may be part of that process. Culture is a part of that process. We're also interested in, of course, responsible research assessment. And here's a quote from the report that Stephen highlighted from the Research on Research Institute, which is a useful definition, I think, of what we mean by responsible research assessment. But I want to highlight this word because for me, responsibility is a relational term. So responsibility to whom and for what? And this brings us back to the social contract that I think you highlighted, Stephen. Uh, we need to think about, you know, for whom are we assessing research and for what? For what purpose? And that responsibility word, I think, bears a certain amount of scrutiny. So those are some of the things that we, we care about as the basis for what I'm going to go on to say. Now, I'm actually going to give you quite a lot of indicators, metrics, quantitative indicators in what I'm about to say. And I'm not going to apologise for that because I think that's quite useful. So I'm going to start here that there are problems. This is published um, in the annual statement from the UK Committee on Research Integrity. It's a quote from the IRISE International Survey of Research Integrity. And I find these figures quite shocking. The levels of what you might call questionable research practices that are reported, self-reported by researchers in the survey, over half including authors who had not contributed sufficiently to a paper to warrant that inclusion. Around half not conducting a thorough review of the manuscript, inadequate supervision of co-workers, failure to cite publications that contradict your beliefs. One in six researchers report that. And these are not things that researchers are going to likely admit. So these are likely to be underestimates. And I think just drawing on the point you were making, Stephen, if we want to make a connection between research assessment the quality of the research, the evidence is there, the evidence is there. So there are problems. Researchers working in the sector understand that there are problems. So what do they ascribe those problems to? So this is a quote from um, 
the landscape report on research integrity that was put out by um, UK Research and Innovation, led by VTI and UKRN and the UK Research Integrity Office back in 2020, I think. Um, and researchers were then asked, you know, in terms of the incentives that you feel in the culture that you're working in, what incentivizes you towards uh, positive research integrity and what incentivizes you towards negative, um, negative research integrity, poor research integrity? And I think it's really quite revealing. Um, we feel quite uh, reassured that a lot of the open research practices that the UKRN and others have been advocating for a long time, open access publishing, data sharing, and so on, uh, positively uh, associated with high levels of research integrity, as are interdisciplinary research, professional development, and good leadership and management should not be underestimated. But if you look at the negatives, so I will highlight, you know, poorly implemented workload models, um, incidents of bullying and harassment, but the rest of the things in that red box are things that are very much associated with poor research assessment. And so while research assessment is not the only thing that's in, uh, correlated with, with problematic research integrity, it's it's a really important factor, according to the researchers that responded to this survey. So here's a, another set of uh, views from researchers. These are taken from a, a Dutch survey, a very large survey of researchers in the Netherlands. And they uh, asked in a, a very clever research method, which encouraged researchers to really be honest in the ways that they, they responded. Yeah. To what extent have you uh, in, indulged, if you like, or practiced questionable research practices in the last three years? And to what extent have you used responsible research practices in the last three years? It actually found that over half had uh, practiced questionable research practices in the previous three years, which again indicates that there is something to be sorted out. Um, but if you look at the um, look at the factors uh, that are down as explaining that what researchers feel are explanatory factors, and this was done by a, quite a, an in-depth regression analysis that found that responsible mentoring, so mentoring where the, uh, the mentor is espousing scientific norms of high quality research, uh, of a positive research culture and care for the, for the person being mentored is very positively associated with high levels of research integrity. And lack of, um, uh, of responsible research practices. As is funding pressure, weirdly. <laughs> um, adherence to scientific norms, the likelihood of detection. Um, but if you look at the, the explanatory factors for questionable research practices, we've got publication pressure, we've got survival mentoring. So this is mentoring where you're advising your uh, your colleague, this is what you need to do to get ahead in your career. Never mind scientific norms, never mind good practice. If you want to get ahead and be successful, this is what you need to do. So that is very positively associated with questionable research practices. And you can see work pressure and competitiveness there. So this is this paints a complicated picture actually, and it's not straightforward. What are the associations between uh, research assessment positive research culture and high quality research. But it does, I think, point to the value, and this is something I'll be coming back to, of meta research in this area. We really need to know the evidence on which we can base act our actions. So that's what researchers feel, perhaps, you know, a current set of evidence, if you like, what researchers feel the causes are of some of the problems that we've highlighted. So what do researchers value? And what do they think their institutions value? You can't read that. Uh, so I'm sorry about you may be able to read it, I don't know. So I've tried to summarise this on the left-hand side. This was from uh, the On Merit European project, which finished a, a year or two ago. Uh, it was broadly speaking, that project, about some of the inequities that might flow from open science and open research. But it did do this very interesting survey of what researchers value in the way that they practice research and what they think their institutions value in the way that they do research. 
And there's a discrepancy, unsurprisingly, perhaps researchers value open research, engagement, citizenship type activities, and they feel that their institutions value grant funding, intellectual property, and published papers. And that discrepancy, I think, is really telling in the ways that um, research assessment is both practiced and, and understood. Um, and it's quite a helpful explanatory uh, piece of data, uh, data point. So this is an analysis I, I did a couple of days ago. We at the UK Reproducibility Network ran a survey a couple of years or a year and a half ago of researchers about open research. We take those as being examples of some of the things that researchers feel are important to high quality research. And we asked the researchers, you know, what, what approaches are your institutions taking to promoting open research? Are they, are they broadly passive? Are they sort of taking a very monitoring and compliance type approach? Or are they taking a, a recognition and reward and positive incentives kind of approach? And we asked them, whatever approach you think your institutions are taking, do you, you know, how effective is, is that approach, do you think? And the conclusion was, they don't know. They don't know the answers to either of those questions, which I think is, is really interesting. Um, I'll come back to it in, in a minute. So I was advertised, and I should probably do it since I was advertised as describing some of the findings from a recent uh, survey of institutions that the, the Open Research Programme that I run uh, has run part of the OR4 project. Uh, and that uh, is about changing in the ways in which institutions recognize and reward open research practices. So we've got a, a consortium or a group of now 44 institutions across the United Kingdom that have joined in with that project. Uh, we're developing tools and resources to help them reform the ways in which they assess researchers to better recognize a whole range of different open research practices. And as a part of that project, we ran a survey, sort of baseline survey, if you like, of what institutions are currently doing with respect to both uh, responsible research assessment, but also open research uh, and the ways in which those two things are, are linked together. We got responses from about, well, from exactly, in fact, 60 institutions, 59 of which were higher education institutions, one of which was a research institute. Uh, we published the report from that uh, a couple of weeks ago now. Um, very grateful to Stephen for reviewing that report. Um, and I think it, it is a really helpful baseline to, for us to understand now the current situation in the United Kingdom. And I hope it's a useful baseline for the, the new UK national chapter, Dolara. Um, broadly speaking, uh, most institutions are responding to the responsible research assessment and the open research agendas at the senior level. So there are senior level sort of commitments and responsibilities that are established for both of those things. There are warm words said, there are statements made and so on. Um, but um, it's fair to say that responsible research assessment is not embedded <clears throat> in practice. So fewer than half of promotion policies explicitly referenced responsible research assessment uh, statements or policies. Uh, the remainder either you know, explicitly lacked alignment or were not aligned with responsible research assessments. Um, there's very little in the way of, of guidance and training and so on for the people who are actually involved in putting those things into practice. So there's a lot of practical work to do beyond the sort of strategic level commitment of institutions. And open research is not well recognised or rewarded as a part of this in almost all institutions. So that's where we are in the UK, which is um, not where we would like to be. I think it would be fair to say, but at least it sets us a clearer sort of understanding of, of where we might go next. So in summary, just to sort of <coughs> skim through what I think I've said, you may think that I've said something different, I think there is evidence that poor research practices are really quite prevalent. They're much more prevalent than we would typically like to think. Problematic research assessment is one of a number of causes that researchers cite for this. So we need, you know, research, reforming research assessment is not a magic bullet. 
we need to do other things as well if we're going to address some of these problems. There is a difference between what researchers value and what they think their institutions value, but researchers mainly don't know how their institution is putting its institutional values into practice. Many institutions have a strategic commitment to a responsible research assessment, but practices are not yet embedded. But this is, this is a complicated, nuanced, and in some cases slightly contradictory picture, isn't it? Because if researchers are citing research assessment for research assessment as one of the major causes for the problems in research, and at the same time saying they don't know how their institution is in promoting uh, open research, <clears throat> then how are they managing to cite research assessment as being one of the main causes? So I think the evidence is broadly going in a particular direction, but there are a lot of nuances in that that we could really dig into and understand better if we're going to have a good basis on which to plan for the next steps. I'm actually going to stop there. I had a few more slides, but I'm going to stop there because the conversation will be more interesting than my slides. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good morning everybody. My name's Emma Day, I'm the Senior Project Manager at VTI, and I'm going to talk to you today a bit about the Koara Booze project, um, which hopefully will sign really well with the other people. I also might mention another project that we're working on, um, which is OSIS, which is about the link between open science and research assessment, but I can already see that we're probably going to run out of time for that today, so that might, you might address that in the questions. Because as the other speakers have said, I'm really keen that we have enough time for the conversation at the end of it. Okay, so this is the image that we use in Koala um, for research assessment. Um, and it's basically um, it's quite clunky. It's an iceberg. It's saying that what we're measuring is particularly iceberg. By doing that, we're potentially negatively affecting the quality and the impact of research, um, contributing to an healthy research culture. And continuing to feed um, a potentially quite uh, difficult and, and challenging publication system. Um, I won't talk too much on this because Steve has done it far better than I ever could. But yeah, I, the point is to make that you know, this has come a long way in terms of development. A number of reports have been written, um, a number of initiatives, um, most predominantly DORA, which has been you know, the trailblazer in terms of doing this. Um, has taken us to the point of the Koara Agreement um, in July 2022. Okay, so these are the Koara commitments. Um, and I urge you to look at them and just reflect on both your own view of them and how you think they may land both in your institution and in the UK more widely. The top four are the kind of headlines. So I've bolded them. But the other six are the kind of supporting commitments, really. Um, <laughs> So around recognising the diversity of contributions to and careers in research in according with the needs and nature of the research. Uh, the second one is about qualitative evaluation over quantitative. Third, abandon inappropriate uses in research assessment of journals and publication-based metrics, in particular journal impact factors and H index. And finally, avoid the use of rankings of research organisations in research assessment. So they're quite big um, in terms of ambition and cultural change. Um, as I said, the other six are really around resource, around sharing practice, um, around awareness raising, um, evaluation. So they're, they're kind of supporting to get us to those top four companies. Um, so if your institution signs um, the Kawara agreement, that is what they have committed to. So in terms of if you become a signatory to, to Kawara, um, Strathclyde, for example, are, um, and are leading the national chapter, um, you endorse that commitment publicly. So you sign and therefore you are on the Kawara website as um, a listed signatory. You then have to develop an action plan, um, which you have up to one year to complete. I'll talk a bit about the action plans in a moment. Then you have the option, um, well, you don't, it's actually not then, you, you can become a member without doing your action plan. You have the option then to become a member. Most signatories do. Um, that gives you access to the national chapters and to the working groups. Again, I'll talk a bit more about those in a moment. It also gives you a vote um, 
at the General Assembly and a vote in terms of appointing steering committee members. And it will give you access to the networking events, which we're still getting up and running at the moment. At the moment, membership is free. Um, whether it will be in the future, who knows? Um, currently, we have some funding, so we're able to do this work. Um, so, yeah, I would urge you, if it is interesting, to join now and become a member. So the Kawara Action Plans. So Kawara mm -hmm. is deliberately very bottom-up in terms of approach. The challenge with that is it can mean that things are very kind of fluid and nobody's really too sure exactly where they're starting at the moment. Um, we do have some guidance on development of the action plans. Like I say, it's been deliberately left vague because we want institutions to be able to look at it and adapt it for their needs. Um, so bear in mind, we've got lots of different institutions, lots of different national contexts to work with. Um, and we want them to be achievable. You know, we want them to be that, that line between ambitious but achievable. Um, however, I think it's becoming clear that we need more guidance around action plans. And one of the things we're looking to do this year is some webinars um, to get more kind of structure in place around the action plans. Um, the other thing that we're doing is act as action plans are signed off, they're going on to Zenodo, so they're open access. So we're hoping that we can start to build a bank um, of sample action plans so that you can kind of draw inspiration from. Alongside that, we're doing some analysis in the Kawara project around what's coming through from action plans so we can start to put some thematic um, guidance together around what people are doing, what people are not doing. Okay, so a little bit about Kawara Boost, which is the project that I'm involved in. So Kawara Boost is basically the secretariat for Kawara. Um, and what's really exciting, I think, is we know with all of these initiatives, you need some resource behind them. You know, you can have the most passionate, um, ambitious people, but it, it needs to become somebody's day job to make these things happen. Um, otherwise, it, it can be the thing that falls off the to-do list, however well-meaning or inspired you are. So this is a kind of a bit of a, hopefully, a landmark in terms of this conversation around research or assessment. It's a three-year project, um, five million euros in funding, but over half of that will be distributed um, two institutions to do projects around research or assessment. And what I was really hoping is that I could tell you a bit more about that today in terms of the criteria, because the criteria is due out any moment is with the steering board at the moment. Um, the time scale for it is it will launch mid to late April and it will be open for two months. Um, so I think the cascade funding will be again, something to kind of watch and be aware of. And as soon as we've got anything to communicate around that, I will, I will let you know. Um, so the four objectives, obviously, it strengthens Kawara's operational capacity. Um, it means that we can, can do activities. Um, the second, the really interesting one, is it gives a space where we can look at what knowledge is coming through from all the national chapters from the working group and try to kind of pull together some kind of some policies and some kind of blueprints for institutional change in a way that we haven't been able to do in the past. Obviously, we'll facilitate collection and exchange of good practice and one of the main aims is to widen the coalition's membership in Europe and beyond. Okay, so the different coalition bodies of Koara, you have the General Assembly of Members, any Koara member um, institution can join the General Assembly. Um, it's planned to meet annually, but I think at the moment it's meeting a bit more often than that. There's a few um, online meetings and there's also talk of an in-person meeting in September. Um, all members can vote. Um, in all elements of government and, and let the steering board. Um, the steering boards were elected a few months ago. Um, they are responsible for strategic oversight for anything within Kawara. Then you have the working groups, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. They are, like any working group, voluntary, um, and they're clutching yes. around the community to practice around specific topics. Um, and finally, you've got the coalition secretary. Um, so that shows membership by type of organisation across Koara as a whole. Uh, I think that was last week that we currently have 627 member organisations and 800 signatories. And if you just think back to the commitments, that's a lot of people that have signed up to those commitments. That's a lot of institutions. So there's, and currently action plan wise, we're very limited in terms of how many have come through. So I say a big piece of work this year is to turn those, those signatories into action plans. Uh, if you look, I mean, unsurprisingly, the vast majority are universities and um, research centres. That is actually different in the UK, though. Um, when I don't know if we've done that analysis yet, but I had a quick look through uh, the UK members. 
Um, I think it's a much broader spread in the UK across who we have. So we have slightly less universities and a few more organisations at the moment. Uh, membership by country, 47 countries. Um, winning at the moment in terms of membership are uh, Spain, Italy, Poland. It, I mean, none of this will surprise anybody, I don't think, around where kind of um, these initiatives tend to flourish at the moment. Um, so now it's very reactive. It's um, people can apply to join. What we'll look to do in the future is look to be a bit more proactive, proactive and engage with countries around how we might be able to kind of um, work with them. There's a big objective in Quora to go beyond Europe. Um, there's some limitations in terms of doing that that Neil and I have discussed. Uh, we will see how this goes. Um, largely that a lot of the funding that they're eligible for is, is EU focused, so it's commission focused. So we're trying to engage with people internationally, but currently we haven't got any funding to do that. And that's another way of showing it in, so in terms of our outreach currently. So the working groups of Koara, um, again, very bottom up, um, I think approximately 40 different consortiums put in these working groups, um, all, all around different topics um, in the world of research assessment, some of which um, are very you know, um, obtuse or specific, some of which we can see already that there's going to be some crossover between. Of those, 13 um, were successful, and we now have 13 Koara working groups. Um, there they are. Any member organisation can join a working group. The challenge is we've set a lot of pairs um, at this point, and they are, in one way, they've gone different directions. In other ways, they're crossing over each other. A lot of them want to do surveys. There's a risk that we um, annoy our members with a survey a week from each working group. There's a real risk um, that we reinvent the wheel and actually some of these things are working on uh, things in parallel so uh, a big job of the Koara Secretariat is to try and kind of ensure that we're working in a really, really lean way um, across the working groups that what we're doing is meaningful and that we're not say, repeating um, and wasting energy because this is all you know these are not funded um, this is all people's spare time and we know with these working groups it will be the thing that at times might fall off the to-do list if they're not seen to be meaningful. So we, there's a big job in ensuring that they are meaningful. We're really kind of analyst, um, analyzing what's going on with them. Okay, we also have national chapters um, and it's Strathclyde have been brilliant in pulling together the UK in terms of us having a national chapter. Um, the national chapters met for the first time uh, last month in Porto. And what really came through from that meeting was that national chapters have a great role in really kind of looking at and being honest about national context. So we have the commitments, but we have to look at our own um, countries and look at what is achievable, what we can do, um, where we stand and really map that. And I think that's a really key role for the national chapters. And again, to really support action plans in terms of making sure that they're relevant because yeah, there's no point if they're not, and that maybe that they we have some broad national objectives as well within that, that we can look at what are we trying to achieve, because we're trying to do everything in one way to achieve nothing. Um, there are, currently we have 15 national chapters. The highlighted ones are the three that are most recently on board. Again, not surprising that it's the same countries that we saw that were the stars in the previous slide. Um, again, I think that's I think that's inevitable, but I think it's something that we need to work to um, reducing in the coming years. So, at this point in spring 2024, um, the first cascade funding calls will open um, in the next month or so. Um, once we have criteria, we'll communicate that as widely as possible. We have 13 operational working groups. Uh, there is a plan for another call for working groups. For now, that has been held because I think probably 13 is enough. Um, and also, I think it's becoming apparent that maybe in another call for working groups, we, it might be worth focusing a little in terms of what, what are the gaps? Where do we, you know, rather than another open call, there might be areas, uh, topics that we actually identify that we do need a working group in. So we'll look at that in a year or so's time. Um, 
third bullet point, we have kind of all the systems in place now for the governance of COARA. So it is around kind of uh, elections and the steering board, everything that we need to operate um, properly and as we should. Um, it's clear we need a lot more support for development of action plans, and we need to look at how we engage with our communities, so much more than networking opportunities and so on. That's just... Um, says how the different ways that members can engage with Koara. I think it is, it's an exciting time, but it's a challenging time in, in terms of anything like this, in terms of getting it off the ground and making it of use to all of, you know, all of the individuals here in their day jobs. Um, and again, I'm sure you, you will all have slightly different perspectives on how this could potentially operate or not within your own institution and where, where your own institution might sit on it. Um, I'm going to just talk really briefly. I had... Like Neil, I had a lot more slides, but I'm not going to use them. But I am just going to mention a project that, another project that we're working on, because um, I think it might be relevant for later discussions, um, which is OPUS, which is another Horizon Europe project. Um, it started in September 2022. Um, it's another three-year project, and it is around developing a series of measures to reform um, research assessment towards a system that looks at rewarding open science. So currently what we've done is we've developed a framework um, of <laughs> indicators and interventions to reward open science. Um, and they're currently being tested at the moment with our pilot institutions. Um, so we've developed this framework. Um, our pilot institutions have selected um, which ones they want to work on and which ones they don't. Um, it's a, currently it's a uh, all encompassing framework. So they've been quite narrow in what they've picked, but I think that's fine because they're testing it properly. Um, and then we will look at how they work. Um, or not worked. Uh, we will also have an open consultation in that at some point later in the year. Um, I could go into the framework in more detail, but again, I think we're on, um, at time for questions. So I will stop there, but thank you. Yeah, so there was one question online, which was about, um, I think one of the comments Neil, you made about publication pressures as an explanation for questionable research practices. So as a panel, do you have any indication or thoughts about what those pressures may be? So is it, for example, the quantity of publications, the impact of publications, or the, the venue of publications where things are published? Uh, all of the above. <laughs> um, yeah, and it has become conventional wisdom, hasn't it, that you know, the measure of success as a, as a researcher is the crafting of a beautiful research paper that gets published in a prestigious journal. Uh, and there's all sorts of problems with almost every word in that sentence. Uh, and um, there are obvious pathways from some of those problems towards practice that we could, we could flesh out. And I think some of them were in my presentation and those of others. Um, well, uh, I, I, well Dora, I can only agree with everything that Neil has said. Um, I mean, I do detect, you know, positive moves and, and shifts away from that. And I think the, um, the sort of rise and the uptake of the narrative CD format is a way to try and neutralize some of that publication pressure because it, you know, that is a format that asks people to identify, they don't just publish their whole list of papers and with the impact factor and, and alongside it, but actually they're asked usually to identify, you know, what are their three or four papers that they think are their most important contributions and to say why. And in the why, not to say it's important because it's published in this journal X or whatever, but to say, you know, why has it moved the field on or what has it led to? And also what the real strength of that is because certainly in my field, which is life sciences, many papers are multi-author. So you might get your name on a big paper, but what did you actually do? Was, was the experiment your idea? Uh, was the whole study your idea? Or were you just asked to do the experiment that is panel G on figure four? You know, so, uh, and so it allows you then to, and it allows the assessors to drill down into what you do. And I think, and that's a useful tool. I think it's it has the precision that it doesn't then overburden panels. And I think it actually has the robustness for actually getting at the truth of what people's contributions are. And I think once people see that those tools are being used, then they will have more confidence that they don't have to publish in so-called prestige destinations 
what matters is that they publish it, that they publish it openly, and that they are confident that people will see and recognize good work when they read it. Yeah, I don't have much more to add, really. I, I mean, I think it is just it's it's the disconnect with the societal contracts, isn't it? It, it, it is the you know people that um, Neil just said it, it's become conventional wisdom that that is you know the mark of the good researcher, and actually once you step away from that, you query why that is and why that might be, and certainly it just leaves so much of what a researcher is, who is a human being, untouched and untapped. And yeah, I just think it's important that we reconsider how that might be and yeah, look at other options. Thank you all. Question in the room? Um, well, I think it's true that there are some people who have clearly <laughs> benefited from the current system and that's what they learned. And certainly I, as a young you know, applying for jobs when I was a postdoc in the mid 90s, I was, you know, aware that, you know, what a university wants is someone who can bring in grant money and publish papers and is prepared to do a bit of teaching as well. But that was then seen as a, a secondary thing. I think that has changed. Certainly, I, I mean, I've been at, I'm at, I'm at Imperial College, I've been there since 1995. Okay, so long in the two. And over the year, I have seen that that, you know, that, that, that has changed. Partly the introduction of student fees, uh, I think it, we focused the uh, university's attention on, on the quality of the teaching and the, and the need to recognize that as, a, as an activity. Um, some of these people, I think it's a minority because I think a lot of people recognize there are structural issues within the way that the academy runs and that it's really not sustainable and that there are healthier and better ways to do it. You will enter the old dinosaur and unfortunately to some degree as Max Planck once said of physics you know physics advances one funeral at a time um, <laughs> so um there may be a little bit of that that has the clear I, I do think there is a role for leadership I mean Neil referred to recognizing that good management and leadership and I don't think in, the, in higher education we do enough to train people and to value leadership and inspirational leadership in particular. So I think of people like Randy Sheckman, who's a Nobel Prize winning cell biologist, who on the day that he was given his Nobel Prize announced that he was no longer going to publish in Cell, Nature or Science. <laughs> now he was therefore then immediately denounced as a massive hypocrite because his CV was loaded with <laughs> Cell, Nature and Science papers and he just got the Nobel Prize apparently for that. But but he was showing that uh, actually, you, you know, there are, he was challenging the status quo. And then people worried, well, what about the postdocs in Randy Sheckman's group? You know, but, well, A, you're working in Randy Sheckman's group. So that's obviously your CV. And Sheckman, in reference, can then say, this is lab policy. And I think, you know, postdoc X has done fabulous work. But there is still a lot of work to do, as we've seen in the, the, the data that Neil showed about um, building an uh, you know, incredible mechanism. Right? And I think unless people start believing that they will be valued on what they've done, then uh, you know, we're, we're not going to get there yet. I think it's like any long-term cultural change. It, it takes a long time and it is slow. Um, I mean, I think one of the things we're really focused on in Coara is, is looking at how we work with funders and looking at how we, you know, without meaning to be kind of um, a bit ruthless about it, how does that resonate with so UKRI for example have signed up to the coal for our commitments how will that look in terms of their action plan because uh, if that action plan is bold that could have massive effect um for the for all UK institutions so I think there's something around looking at that as well and getting that really you know that, that funded those funding initiatives in place. um the other thing that we're really looking at is things like promotion criteria and just how researchers develop and again without meaning to sound too kind of selfish about it if that is how um, research is judged and how researchers will advance in an institution that might also um, produce some change. A couple of very quick points. Uh, yeah, totally recognise um, the situation that you found yourself in and I've heard that past many times, unfortunately. A couple of quick things just to add to the excellent points that have been made. Leadership, really important. We should be looking outside of our sector for examples of good leadership. We should be looking to the military. We should be looking to the cultural sector. We should be looking to the health services. There are lots of places where good leadership, not always, but we can find examples in other sectors that we really should be learning from. 
Uh, the other thing, there is a very specific point of intervention, which is perhaps to, uh, specific to our sector, which is the research supervision role. So the, the role of the research supervisor. And there's some great work just starting out at the University of York, a new project on training research supervisors. There's work going on at the University of Hull and elsewhere to try to introduce good practice into that relationship and the ways in which research is, is mentored and brought on in that relationship, which will not only help the person being supervised, the doctoral student, but also bring the supervisor along with them. Mm -hmm. Um, well, as one of the co-authors of the yeah. one symmetric title mm -hmm. board, let me have a have a have a crack at that. It's a huge and important question, and I think you're right. There are risks that it all keeps involved. The enlarging the people culture and environment mm -hmm. section, it just creates a huge burden because people don't really know what are they supposed to write. Nobody likes it when the rules to the reference change uh, because they they understood the rules before and now the rules have changed and. Yes, there is a lot of gaming going on, and, and one has to be aware of the, the risks that are involved. Um, there is, I mean, as I showed in my last slide, so there is work going on now, uh, uh, led by Technopolis and Vito, but that will is now entering its consultation phase, and I would encourage you know every uh, to to engage with that because I think it is an open question, and the particular structure of how you define what. A, positive research culture looks like is an open question and one that we as a community all together have to answer. That's not it's not something that research England or UKRI can can dictate. I think we all recognize there are things that are in the sector at the moment. On top of that, as you say, there are tremendous financial pressures. I don't think we can yet fully appreciate the scale of the world post-election, we will see it at the minute that the, the Secretary of State last week was sat in Parliament and said, I don't see any problem with university funding at the moment. And that's, to my mind, a, a, a willful, willful blindness. Um, so tremendous pressures. Uh, I don't want the, the the sort of people, culture and environment to be boiled down to a set of individuals. I think some quantitative measures are important. I think, you know, if universities can report on, you know, what progress have you made in recruiting or promoting women to the level of professor in the last five years, is an interesting piece of data around how effective you are tackling the gender pay gap or uh, other issues of diversity. But I think also we, as I said, we would want the, the, the ref to allow a degree of openness and plurality and innovation, I think, in terms of articulating this. I know people want, tell me what the rule is and I'll do that. They don't necessarily want openness, but I think at, at least at this stage, because the REF is always an evolving process and it is a controversial process, uh, but I think at this stage, then allowing that room for innovation is, it is in itself something that could be... The pilot exercise over the next 18 months. Yes, yes. Um, I agree with everything you've been said. Uh, Sim, just uh, add perhaps some um, build on to that. Um, slightly pick up on your question, which is a bit controversial thing to do. So, it, researchers instinctively know what a positive research culture and when they're working. I think common sense is sometimes can be misleading, and I think we might want to. Uh, it, it, I can imagine situations where people feel themselves to be in a positive research culture, but that research culture is in fact quite exclusive to those who are not in it. And so we probably need to be a bit careful about instinctive understandings of what a positive research culture is. Um, second point, uh, I'll quickly make, yeah, I think there are absolutely pressures in the sector that are coming. And you know, we talk optimistically about revising the ways in which research is assessed to, to improve the ways in which staff are recruited and promoted. We don't speak very much about the ways in which staff are made redundant. We we'll probably need to be a little bit realistic about what the next five years hold, the ways in which research assessment is going to play a role in that, I'm afraid. Um, a bit of cold water there. But, um, <laughs> but the other thing I'd like to stress is, yeah, obviously the institutions are going to play the ref game. Um, but this is a real opportunity, I think, for institutional leaders to show leadership and say, 
We know what our institutional mission is. We know what's going to build a positive research environment here for our researchers. If the ref rewards us for that, that's good. We're going to do it anyway. So well, that is slightly undermined, unfortunately. Wasn't there an announcement this week that actually, even based on the allocations that result from the last ref, are not going to be paid in full? There isn't an yeah, and, and sadly, you've got the wrong member of staff here today because my colleague was here. She'd have a lot more to say on research culture, um, and she's really in the, co the consultation at the moment. So yeah, sadly, you've got me. Um, but yeah, I think that's we we've, we've developed at Vita um, a research culture framework um, to try and get a common language. It won't be perfect. It, it's never are, but to try and get a common language around what the research culture looks like. Um, so I would urge you to. Look and, and this is the time to influence that, uh, I say positively. Um, I think the pressures in the sector are going to be terrible. Um, but to pick up on Neil's earlier point, I think they're going to be terrible in lots of sectors. Um, so I think academia at times falls into a trap of thinking that it's special in some way. But actually, a lot of these challenges are faced in a lot of different sectors. And I think your point about drawing inspiration from other sectors is, is important if you're not reinventing the wheel. Um, I'm involved in a project, another project, a Horizon Europe project, which is looking at precarity um, and looking at tenure track like models and looking at how we train, if we have researchers on a tenure track like model, how we train them to be future leaders and we how we train them in terms of culture and establishing the, the if they are our future leaders in our institutions, what sort of culture will they be looking to create? So again, we're mindful that if we start to look at these processes and start to look at how institutions do that, we can, we'll see a shift. Okay, that's an interesting observation, mm -hmm. but it's not one I have to say that I recognize uh, from my own local experience. Um, I mean, the impact the work we have actually increased between 2014 and 2021 from 20% to 25%. And I think that's because it was recognized that actually was a lot more work. It made the rep a lot more expensive, but actually universities found out an awful lot more about the, the impact of their research than they had to even, even appreciated. And I think the impact about, you know, it's definitely here to say politically, it's extremely important. And I think a lot of academics don't recognize how well it plays. And, you know, even at the treasury, which is the, Department and government's attention that you really, really do. And in terms of the sort of culture and EDI agenda, I my sense is that that, that actually has become embedded and is, you know, there is a lot of momentum behind it. It's, it's you know, encountering the headwinds of the culture wars at the moment. But, you know, I have also spent the last six years as the Associate Provost for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at Imperial. And and, and I, will, I was the first incumbent in that post, but I see across the UK, you know, there are equivalent positions being created at most universities. And that, you know, I mean, Athena Swan, for all its faults, uh, has become busy in bed. I think almost all universities engage in it to some degree or other, but building on the success of that charter mark, then other, you know, attention to other aspects of equality and diversity is now, you know, are now getting the attention that they are, that they are due. You know, so you know, we we signed up for the race quality charter, for example, and that was the first time as an institution we'd ever looked at our staff and student data with regard to ethnicity, and we identified some very very clear problems, and there are now you know resources going into to trying to tackle those. Still a long way to go, I'm sure, but I don't I don't know. I don't, my sense is you know, the momentum is there, and there are there are some, and I quoted some in my talk who. Who see that you know who who you know, they tow this line that oh playing to EDI it's all about compromising on quality for the sake of letting you know these people who just weren't good enough to make it on the ground so and I absolutely reject that conceptualization of the attention that we need to uh, to pay because we are turning away from our doors you know massive pools of talent uh, that we that that uh, over over the past several years both in terms of student recruitment and staff. And, and we need to reverse that. And I think the ref has a part to play in that, but it, the ref doesn't need to duplicate all the other stuff that's going on, which is why I think that, you know, 
the universities can pull in data from their action plans on Athena Swan or on race equality or on disability to show the change that's happening on the ground and that will that's the evidence that supports their narratives. I think Thank sustainable you. clearly yeah. looking at sustainability of the ref has to be important. Whatever the step is. Questions online? So we have a couple more questions online. One of them is about um open research in that context, and particularly the library is doing much in the open research space, but this work is often undervalued or simply not recognized. So, what do you think can be done to strengthen relationships between the library and researchers, in particularly in institutions which are maybe not as research intensive? I'm just recognizing that there's quite a lot of people in the room today who are um in professional services. I think that really ex expands to almost all of you know, Stephen's Venn diagram there of quite often it's professional services staff who are taking this forward and how can we um, make sure that work is valued and recognised and, and build that relationship. Well, as someone who's been a researcher and a professional services person in the library, um, I've got a personal stake in this, uh, and it's really important. This is one of the reasons why last year uh, we brought together national representatives for uh, professional services uh, sort of organisations um, to have a talk about what their contributions were to open research. Uh, and that obviously included managers and librarians and research software engineers, uh, but it also included people that you might not immediately think of, such as the finance office, science communications and marketing people and so on. Uh, we're going to produce a set of case studies as a result of that, and they will highlight I hope they're going to come out in the next month or two and they will highlight some of those contributions. Uh, but some of them are harder to explain. They're less direct, but I think they're really important. I think the role of the finance office, for example, is incredibly important in open research, not just in open access, but in making the resources available and providing the channels for uh, data stewards, data curators, um, search software engineers, and, and so on, all, all, all the range of staff that are really important for making open research possible. Um, I mean, I think there are, with, with things like the credit taxonomy, there are opportunities, I think, for professional services staff to see their contributions recognised in research papers. But I really wouldn't want their contributions to be limited to that kind of recognition, because that's only a very small part, I think, of the kinds of, uh, the kinds of recognition they, they would need. Yeah, what, what we've done in the OPUS framework is we've looked very much at, so if you uh, want to measure a particular open science indicator, Underneath it, each indicator is a series of interventions that ask the questions around, you know, who do have you, do you have you given resource to this? So is there a person, if they're in the library, do they have ample time? Do they feel that they have ample time to do this? Are they, are they connected with the researchers? So is there awareness of who they are? Do they have the right date access to databases? So under each individual indicator to look at that role. So if it is a library member of staff, is it, are you adding to their role? Or if you've suddenly added this new indicator in, have you allowed the additional resource time and expertise to do it and do it properly? Um, so we're trying to kind of flip it around that way. And expect it. Uh, just to add, I mean, I, I think absolutely professional and technical and operational staff have a hugely important role to play in the sort of the healthy culture and in the outputs uh, produced. I think it's still true, and I certainly see it at in my institution, that there are many academics who simply they don't know what the, what these other staff do, and they kind of just think, oh, you know, I, I bring in the grants and I pay their salary, and you know, they do what I tell them, and and and, and so there is a bit of a, a culture divide there within institutions, and so I do think it is up to the institutions themselves to to try and make sure to bridge that gap. My own. I mean, I got into Dora through, you know, writing and thinking and agitating about open access. And what I've seen certainly across the UK is just the hugely important role that librarian played in driving forward this agenda. And I think my, our own director of library services, Chris Banks, has been tremendously influential in developing the UK's scholarly communications license, which is now the rights retention. That's been a, a really important. And the library staff did a a uh, massive amount of work to make it easy to comply with the REF's open access requirements from, from last time, just make it really seamless for 
for, for academics when they were publishing to actually then make sure that they uploaded a, a, a copy to the to the to the repository. And that's I, I do think that's still underappreciated, but I, I do think it's it's really up to the institution to make sure that both that they build those bridges in having a culture that values the contribution of everybody and that recognizes what's going to apply to these kind of um, ICT uh, stats because open access is one thing and the, the shift to open research is more of a focus I think on sharing data and I think a lot of that we still haven't figured out how we're going to do that and who's going to pay for that and this is, remains a challenge. Okay, thank you all. I think we're coming to the end of our allocated slot so I'm really willing well to end with one final question and it takes back to the question we posed at the very beginning specifically with potential next steps so that you get principles of responsible research assessment and practice. Well, I closing thoughts on that. Next steps. Uh, well, uh, again, coming back to the, um, the proposals in the harnessing the metric tide, uh, which was built on the insights we had about the particular role that funders have, because they are tremendously important. The EP pays the fiber yep. pays the tune uh, to a degree. And 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 it's it's up to funders to spend that money wisely and to put in place mechanisms that ensure it, it cannot be mismanaged or misspent or and therefore attention to culture and using the ref as that lever, it was very deliberate uh, as a way to you know synergize the ref with this broader momentum around EDI and around addressing bullying and harassment, which is still a uh, um, um, a big a big problem in education and is degrading the quality of higher education. So, so that aligned, and well, uh, Emma, I'm sure will tell us about, but uh, you know, Quara is actually going to help sort of embed even more good practice because as we've seen you know it's fine words are are, are easy to write uh, but really good practices is mm -hmm. hard and i think one of the challenges for the next few years and this is something we think about at dora a lot because we do share and, and uh, uh, lots of instances of good practices i think people want to see um, a bit of curation going on and actually identifying you know what are the policies or practices that people have introduced that are really working that are really making a difference on the ground because I'm a great believer in the myths and that nothing succeeds like success. And if one university is introducing a process that is successful, that's you know recruiting good people who are thriving and doing great research, then everybody else is going to want to copy that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think we still need to put in more resources to do the work to, to do that curation, that sifting of what works. There's lots of things being tried. But I think what people want to do is what's working on the day. And it's still early days on that front. Thank you, Stephen. So the obvious and very short-term answer is that we'll have a great meeting this afternoon of the Kawara National Chapter um, for the UK. And we'll start to really, and I think this is the exciting bit, look at what that means for the UK and wrestle with some of those issues that we know are going to be complex. Um, so I think that's that's that will be a real positive. And also looking at how we recruit more institutions in the UK to be part of that that movement, um, particularly some of the larger research intensive ones. You know, if we can start to look at that and bring them in, that would be that would be helpful. Um, again, I think making sure, as you've said, that the, the action plans are meaningful and starting to get some practice that is working and succeeding will be great because yeah, it's very chicken and egg, isn't it? You, you can't, if there's nothing to follow, it's very difficult to follow it. Um, and, and somehow keeping that all tied in in terms of research. Oh, the last place in these things is a terrible place to be. I feel I'm simply going to paraphrase what Stephen and Emma have said. Um, so people may change. So this is about community. Uh, so we need to have and support, nurture a community of people who are making the change across the institutions and the funders and others across, in our case, the United Kingdom, but internationally as well. That community is going to be really important and evidence. You call it curation, I think, Stephen, mm -hmm. but it's about yeah, what's worked, what hasn't. You know, I showed some some research evidence of, of some aspects of this problem space that we're working in. We need more of that kind of evidence so that we target our, our very limited resources in the best possible way. Thank you to all the panels. So I'd like to end this session or end this uh, event by thanking Stephen and for their expertise and their insights this morning.
thank the audience for your contributions and uh, your perspectives. And to thank Grace in particular for organizing the event and of course to all colleagues from the research university's research and knowledge exchange services and our organizational staff development unit.